Heavenly Father, we come before you prayerfully and thankfully. Despite the circumstances of the age in which we live, you tell us, when you see these things happening, lift up your head, your redemption draws near. Help us to be mindful of your purpose and your calling, Father, and meet with us tonight in the power of your Spirit, speaking to us by your Spirit from your Word, for the edification of your people, in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Something I think about quite a lot, not only here in Canada, but anywhere, any place I, I go, or when I'm at home with my wife, I think about this a lot. I think that if I was going to have a remnant of people to prepare the way for the return of Christ, and I was going to use these people to recognize the times in which they lived, I would come up with candidates a lot more suitable than that pathetic individual I see in the mirror when I'm shaving or brushing my teeth. We could have been born at any time in history. We could have been born 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. We could, If God wanted us to be born, we could have been born at any time in human history. And we could have been born again at any time in human history. But in the sovereign determination of God, and I'm not a Calvinist, I assure you, but I do believe what the scripture says about his sovereignty, we are not only born at this time, we're born again at this time. My family are Israeli Jews. I'm a mixture, but my family are Israeli Jews. And another thing I often think about is this. Despite being the people of God, and they still are, according to the New Testament and the Hebrew Scriptures, despite having 2,000 years of history from the time of Abraham to the birth of Christ, from the time of Abraham to the birth of Jesus is just as long as from the time of Jesus till now. God dealing with them for 2,000 years. They're about. Despite having the Scriptures... Despite believing the Messiah was coming, despite having the signs of his coming, there was only a, a remnant of Hebrews ready for that first coming. Only a remnant. Not a lot. That remnant did not include the religious establishment. It did not include the Sanhedrin. It did not include the mainstream political parties. The Pharisees, either the school of Shammai or the school of Hillel. It did not include the Sadducees who controlled the priesthood at that time. It did not include the cult groups like the Essenes, nor the political Roman collaborators like the Herodians. The mainstream religious establishment, what was called Judaism at that time, was not ready for the first coming of the Messiah. There were people who were, but they were outside the system. I often think of the character called Yohanan HaMatbir, John the Baptist in English. Actually, it's baptizer in Hebrew. Son of a high priest. Could have been part of the religious establishment from the tribe of Levi, etc., And at that time, there was a religious aristocracy. Yet, John the Baptist chose to go out to the wilderness. He didn't want to be part of it. He knew it was corrupt. He turned his back on it, even though he came from that social class, from that tribe, from that priesthood. Son of a high priest, he turned his back on it. He went out into the wilderness, and all Jerusalem went out to the wilderness to hear John preach, because as we pointed out many times, they weren't being fed or prepared or taught the truth by the Levites in Jerusalem. That's the way it was when he came the first time. That's the way it's going to be 
when he comes the second time. Only now the church, composed of both Jew and Gentile, has 2,000 years of history under its belt. Only now the church, now the church, has had the scriptures for centuries and centuries. Now the church sees the prophetic signs of his coming. And now the church and its leadership are by and large as corrupt as the Sanhedrin ever were. This is the reality. This is the reality. And as I've often pointed out, when I was first saved in the early 1970s in the aftermath of the hippie era, I remember coming here to Vancouver, among other places, smoking marijuana in Stanley Park in the middle of the night, looking at the fountain that changed colors when I was stoned on drugs and things. That's the era in which I, I'd become a believer. And <clears throat> when Christians used the term as a colloquialism, Babylon, it was understood you were referring to nominal Christianity or the false religious system of the world. When Christians said Babylon, there was like the evangelical church and the nominal church. Babylon had to do with false religion, or it had to do with false Christianity. It was what some people said about the Church of Rome, the Greek Orthodox Church, liberal Protestantism, the World Council of Churches, cults like the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. That was Babylon. Now, if I was to use that same term in that same way, I'd have to include mainstream so-called evangelical denominations. Apostasy. Then when I look at the Gospels and I see what kind of people were ready for his coming, it begins to make a little sense to me. Yet, I'm left with the dilemma when I look in the mirror to clean my teeth or shave. I say, you pathetic loser. You miserable excuse for what you're supposed to be. They don't even want to know the truth anymore, most of them. But by my grace, you know the truth, saith the Lord. And look at you and look at your life, Jacob. Yet I'm supposed to sit here and tell you that I and you are called to prepare the way for the return of Jesus. <laughs> there was a fisherman in Galilee, much the same situation. <laughs> the Pharisees were running the show. The Levitical priesthood was controlled by the Sadducees. Much of Judaism had sold out to the Romans, was in bed with them and their pagan religion and political corruption and immoral society. And there was a fisherman, and the Lord called him. And he realized what he was, and he realized what he wasn't. And all he could do was say, Jesus, depart from me. I am a sinful man. <laughs> Why me? And don't take it personally, but I'm not too impressed with you either. I don't think Jesus is. I begin with myself. Why me? Why you? But he's coming, and here we are. We could have been born 500 years ago. We could have been born 1,000 years ago. We could have been born again 2,000 years ago. But he ordained for us to be born and to be born again now. Why us? Why, when mainstream churches and denominations and movements 
have departed from the word of the Lord because they departed from the Lord of the word. Why? People like us wandering around looking for other Christians who believe the same thing can't even find the church most of the time. And I'm not talking about in the Islamic world or somewhere. I'm talking about in the post-Christian, neo-pagan, post-modern, Judeo-Christian world. Yet here we are. Here we are. To understand where we are is not just to know the present. We have to understand where we came from in order to understand where we are. But we need to understand where we came from and where we are in order to understand where we are going. Scriptural Christianity is in free fall. It's in free fall. Orthodox evangelicism no longer per se exists in the mainstream. And like in the book of Kings and Chronicles, it happened within one, two generations. It didn't take long. You can only run on inertia so far. Even Bible belts, like the American South and Midwest or Northern Ireland or places like this, even Bible belts are running on the inertia of previous generations. That'll only take you so far for so long. How do we get here? And where are we going? What is going to happen? And what does Jesus want us to do? What does he want you to do? What does he want me to do? Where does it begin? Look with me, please, to Romans chapter 15. Verse 3, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Understand something. If you're going to hold to the truth, reproach is going to fall on you. As it says in Hebrews, you're going to be outside the camp. The Yom Kippur scapegoat died outside the camp. We're coming up to Yom Kippur in a few days. In Judaism, this is known as the days of awe from the Hebrew scriptures following Yom Tru Ah, which we now mistakenly call Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, but it's not that. It's the Feast of Trumpets, a warning. And these are the days of awe. And we're coming up to the Day of Atonement, all of which have typological meaning prophetically for the return of Christ. That will be in our next book, uh, No Bomb in Gilead. But let's look at this, the reproach. If you don't get along with the program, you're going to take the reproach of Christ. If you're not willing to take the reproach of Christ, to be scorned by other people who profess to be saved Christians. If you're not willing to bear the reproach of Christ, you're not even a candidate. You're not even in the contest. This doesn't mean we go around with a martyr complex, looking to be persecuted, looking to be rejected. There are people who will fall out with any church they go to because they've got a problem. But for those who stand for truth, without compromise, reproach will be the reward. When he comes back, his reward will be with him. But don't expect any reward now. 
And it continues in verse 4. For whatever was written in earlier times, that is the Hebrew Scripture, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. Remember, Christ Jesus is him in eternity. Jesus Christ is him on earth. Yes, it was written for our instruction. What was written to Israel was written for our instruction. But why? So that we would persevere and be encouraged from the scriptures. Our perseverance and encouragement comes from the scriptures. It's a nice thing, it's a good thing, it's a necessary thing to come to an event similar to this one or something and meet other like-minded believers. And the Holy Spirit will use that. Iron does sharpen iron. But the source of our encouragement can only come from the Word of God. The Scripture must be central. If the Scripture is not central, you're not in the race. In a teaching we did about a year ago, a year and a half ago, called The Holy Kiss, we looked at how truth is doctrinal, not relational. One of the characteristics of the backslidden and apostate church is truth has become relational. Somebody is teaching heresy. Somebody is living immorally. Somebody is accommodating immoral living, giving a de facto sanction to divorce and remarriage with no scriptural grounds, allowing people living in that state to be communicants and saying nothing. Well, they didn't drink judgment to themselves. The moral standards eroded teaching doctrines that are scripturally unfounded, practicing things that are contrary to scripture. And you always hear the same, frankly, idiocy. And the word idiotai is found in Corinthians. The idiocy is, oh, but he's a good brother. No, he's not. And a teaching called the Sons of Tzedak, we did quite a number of years ago. We talked about how the Hebrew word for righteous, a righteous person is a tzaddik. And the Hebrew word to be right, as in to be correct, is tzaddik. Unless dramatic, dramatically and etymologically in, in, in the Hebrew language, Unless someone is tzaddik, they are not a tzaddik. You cannot be righteous unless you are right. Having right doctrine does not automatically prove you're a righteous person. But having wrong doctrine automatically proves you are not a righteous person. A righteous person who innocently or through ignorance or circumstances has wrong doctrine, the Holy Spirit's going to show them that is false and they will correct it. Think of believers who get saved in the Roman Catholic Church or a liberal church. The Holy Spirit shows them, get out of this place, doesn't he? Might take a little bit of time, but they're going to realize from the Scripture, this doesn't add up. This is not real Christian. I'm going to get out. But as soon as you see people saying things like, oh, but we have to love. I guess Philippians 1, 9 is not in their Bible. That your love may abound in all knowledge and real discernment. Without knowledge of the scripture and discernment, you do not have the love of Jesus. You have an emotionally charged religiosity. 
You have a counterfeit of love. You have idiocy. That's what they have. What they call love is actually religious idiocy. Truth is doctrinal, not relational. In it, the Word of God, we find our perseverance and our encouragement. To persevere and be encouraged when we bear the reproach, when we are the outcasts. It's not what people say, it's what God has said and is saying. It is a living word. He's still saying it by his spirit to us. We pray, we talk to him, we read this, he talks back. If we listen. So it begins in Romans with an encouragement. Read the Hebrew scriptures. It was written for our instruction. You want to know what's going to happen to you? Look what happened to the Hebrew prophets who stood up for truth in ages of backsliding and apostasy. But then there's the other side of the coin in 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 11. These things happened as examples and written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the earth is come. Let him who thinks he stands take heed that he not fail. Coming down just a bit further, we are told, verse 6, these things happened as examples for us, that we would not crave evil things as they did, etc. On one hand, the Hebrew Scriptures were written for the instruction of Christians, Paul tells us, to understand if we do what Israel did, we're going to reap the same results. On the other hand, they're written that if we do what the faithful remnant of Israel did, we will reap the same results. We live in a fallen world. We have two choices. The reproach of man or the reproach of Christ. Those are the only choices. One way or another in this fallen world, there will be a reproach. We'll experience either the reproach of man or the reproach of Christ. Either the fallen world and together with it, the apostate church isn't going to like you. Or else Jesus isn't going to like you. But one way or another, somebody's not going to like you. That's the reality. But don't get me wrong, his reward is with him. Don't get me wrong. The travail won't matter when he gets here. Don't get me wrong. When you see these things happening, lift up your head. Your redemption draws nigh. All of that and more is true. It's not some kind of a religious masochism. We're just focused and dwelling on the difficulty of the hour in which we are. However, there's no escape from the reality. One way or another, somebody is not going to like us. One way or another, somebody is going to reject us. Either people are going to reject you, or you will reject Christ. When they reject his word, they've rejected him. The centrality of the scripture is the issue. 
If you love me, keep my commandments. Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. No scripture, no relationship with Jesus. Religion, yes. You can have religion. But you can't have Christianity. Without the scriptures, you can have religion. But you can't have Christianity. You can have a counterfeit spirituality. You can have mysticism pretending to be Christianity, but you cannot have Christianity. These things are written for our instruction. Let us be instructed. Turn with me, please, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 5. Ishayahu Hanavi. Here in Canada, Quebec was a religious and to a large degree sociological province of the Vatican. The Western provinces, from Ontario westward to British Columbia, etc., were the province of Great Britain, more Protestant. And later, not only Anglican, Presbyterian, but Mennonite, etc. There is a Judeo-Christian heritage in Canada, inherited from Mother Britain. Now we have to understand that similar to Northern Ireland, of course, Americans don't get this. United States Americans don't get this. But similar to Northern Ireland, the Catholic Protestant thing was related to the conflict between Britain and Irish nationalism as it is between Quebec French nationalism and United Canada. Okay, there's a religious, in the thinking of the people in Quebec, of the, who want a separate Quebec, there's always been a religious factor in that thinking. It's similar to Northern Ireland, though fortunately it has never taken on the, the violent dimension. Nonetheless, we live in a Canada. You live in a Canada. I have relatives who live in, in the suburbs of Toronto, my Canadian family, who are in a Canada that inherited its Judeo-Christian heritage from Britain. You don't think about it. We're holding the scriptures in the English language. Canada has never known persecution before. It's beginning now. A Canadian preacher was fined nearly 10 years ago for reading from the Book of Romans. He was fined 15,000 Canadian dollars in this country. The freedom you've had in Canada was inherited from Great Britain. For all of their mistakes, and they made a lot of mistakes. The Puritans who established parliamentary democracy, which Canada adopted, knew the only way that democracy could work was if it was based on scriptural principles. On the walls of the parliament in Westminster in London, inscribed in Latin, Pater Noster Quius and Chalius, our Father who art in heaven, like the founding fathers of the United States, the founding fathers of parliamentary democracy and the British Commonwealth understood that unless we are governed by men who are governed by God, democracy is doomed to fail. And democracy is failing because we've turned away from the biblical principles. Taking our freedom for granted, here we have this in English. Look at your Bible. Free free to you, free to me, but it cost William Tyndale his life. It cost the Lollards, the followers of John Wycliffe, their lives. 
It caused the Oxford martyrs, Ridley, Latimer, Hooper, Cranmer, it cost them their lives. Oh, it's free. But it's not cheap. It's like our salvation. It's free. But it's not cheap. And Isaiah finds himself in a situation where he's frustrated in verse 20 of chapter 5. And it states, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The diametric opposites of what is even rationally, let alone theologically true have exchanged positions. We think of it. When you call good evil, you're going to call evil good, and when you call evil good, you're going to call good evil. He made them male and female, said it was good. Roman Catholicism, influenced by the... By the the Mancianism of Augustine, even though they would deny it, taught for centuries the only good thing about marriage is having children who will be celibate. Throughout the Dark Ages, for many centuries, Roman Catholicism taught that to serve God, you must go into the monastery or the convent or something like this. The rest were just breeding stock to populate the monasteries and convents. The only good thing about marriage would be having children who would be celibate. That's what they taught for centuries. If you want to know what a Roman Catholic world would look like, look what a Roman Catholic world was like. If you'd want to know what the Church of Rome would do if it had its way in the world, look at what it did do. Nobody stopped it for 12, 13 centuries. And I'm not against Catholic people. I have Catholic family. So, male and female, no, 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 no. They're influenced by Greek dualism and Mancianism. Anything physical must be somehow sinful. The Greek mind would have no problem with John 1, NRK, Kai Logo, through the beginning was the Word, until they got to verse 14. The Word became flesh, the Logos became sarx. Marriage is a necessary evil to procreate, essentially and functionally, that's what it became. So the clergy are celibate. They call something God said is good, evil. And so the clergy in Quebec and in every Roman Catholic diocese in the United States all 171 of them, litigation is pending in two, Fairbanks, Alaska being one. The Roman Catholic Church has become culpable, liable, for protecting pedophile clergy at the expense of not protecting its own children. Paying God knows how many billions of dollars to buy their way out of what they did to children. I was just in Australia, Cardinal Pell's in prison. What did they do? He made them male and female and said it was good. No! You're calling good evil? They call evil good. Oh, the priests, the nuns are godly people, the Roman Catholic Church is... In the United States, the Italian Mafia would not allow their members to engage in child prostitution or child pornography. The Mafia wouldn't allow that. If a member of the Mafia did that, they would get whacked. The Mafia wouldn't protect the pedophile at the expense of children. The Mafia wouldn't do that. It takes the Vatican to go that low. 
It takes the Roman Catholic Church to go that low. It takes a bishop or a cardinal to do something a mob boss, a mafia don, wouldn't do. It's amazing when you call good evil what the results are going to be. He made the male and female as an Adam and Eve. But now it's become Adam and Steve. They call good evil. They call evil good. And if you oppose it, they say you are evil. You are guilty of a hate crime. What it's coming to is something I've been warning about since the early 1980s. They're going to say, your church will not allow a lesbian to be a pastor. That's discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Your church property is no longer tax exempt. You're a hate group. Believe me, there are members of the Canadian Parliament and the present Canadian government that would rubber stamp that tomorrow. They'll protect the apostate church, but they won't protect the true one. They'll protect the whore of Babylon, but they won't protect the bride of Christ. Reproach with a capital R. You call good evil and evil good? Just think of a maternity hospital in Vancouver. You go into the neonatology ward. There'll be incubators. They'll be spending ten, fifteen thousand dollars a day sometimes. to keep a premature baby alive. Some have survived down to 70 weeks gestation. Pulmonary underdevelopment. Months in those incubators, 10, 15 grand a day, add up the cost. 25 weeks gestation. 30 weeks gestation. Take an elevator, one flight up. The reboarding babies of the same fetal age. Under King Manasseh, Israel went too far. Up to King Manasseh, God put up with a lot of sin, including idolatry, every kind of immorality and social injustice imaginable. But when they began killing kids, they went too far. Even when revival came under King Josiah, even when there was a national repentance, they killed too many kids. The only thing the revival could do was delay the inevitable judgments. The Western world has gone too far. You take that baby, the penultimate example of God's love only, the death of Christ is a higher example of God's love than a precious life of a baby, and you kill it. That's what Israel did in Molech worship. We've turned it into an industry, and they tell you it's women's rights. What about the baby's rights? Oh, it's not a baby yet. It hasn't been born. There's a younger baby, one flight up in an incubator, he's been born. But let's look. How did this come about? What was brewing in Israel that resulted in this situation where Isaiah wrote, they call good evil and evil good? 
Let's go back to chapter 1 of Isaiah. Yeshayahu Hanavi Perek Aleph, verse 4. A last sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They've abandoned the Lord. They've despised the Holy One of Israel. They've turned away from me. That term, turn away in Hebrew, is backslide. It is a backslidden nation. The Protestant democracies, especially the English-speaking Protestant democracies, are backslidden nations. In verse 9, unless the Lord of hosts had left a few survivors, we would be like Sodom, we'd be like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The social and cultural acceptance of homosexuality and lesbianism as biologically and culturally normative. Romans chapter 1. God told Moses and told Joshua, you're not to do these things that these heathen nations are doing, and that was among it, the sins of Sodom. Don't get me wrong, before I was a Christian, when I was a kid, I was strung out on cocaine. My drug addiction would have put me in the same hell as someone else's sexual proclivities. The Lord had mercy and saved me. I'm not saying I'm any better than them. I'm simply saved and forgiven. But the same God who delivered me from cocaine can deliver them from sexual abnormality that is destructive to themselves. In Romans 1, when they persist in it, it says three times, God gives them over to it. Not only them, but those who give hearty approval to what they do. And it says that it reiterates it three times in Romans 1. These censored Bibles are removing Romans 1. God gives them over, and not only them, but those who agree with it and support it. These politicians in Ottawa and in Washington and in London are going to hell. How can they repent when the Lord gives them over to it? Once more, they've crossed the line. They have gone too far. I do not say individuals will not repent and believe. Some will. But not a lot. sins of Sodom. They've turned away from their Judeo-Christian heritage. And with that came a moral landslide that became characterized by an exception, by uh, an acceptance of sexual debauchery as God sees it. This is what the early church was up against in the first century Roman Empire. Almost all the emperors were bisexual except for Claudius, who was a homosexual. It was just accepted. The emperor Caligula proclaimed his daughter to be his son. It's unbelievable. Bestiality, that'll be next. What the first century church was up against, that cultural environment, with the, the gladiators, violences, entertainment, things like that, that's what we're going to. In fact, that's where we are. So, they turned their back on the faith of their fathers, and then there was a proliferation of the sins of Sodom. And Gomorrah. 
Gemara comes from the Hebrew infinitive ligbor, to finish. Once a society lends credence to the acceptability of that perversion as normative, ligmor, it is finished. What comes next? Verse 18, come let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Much can be said about that. It has tremendous meanings for the gospel and for messianic prophecy concerning the day of Yom Kippur coming up next week. Again, we deal with this in some of our teaching tapes, and it will be in the forthcoming book, No Bomb in Gilead. Be that as it may, let us reason. We are told in the New Testament, our faith is reasonable. The gospel of Jesus, the Judeo-Christian scriptures, it's not an intellectual faith, but it is an intellectually defensible faith. It's reasonable. There's an apologia, an apologetic for it. It's not reasonable to believe there's Quakers on the moon. As the book of, as the writings of Brigham Young and Joseph Smith teach among the Mormons. It's not reasonable to believe in Mormonism. Mohammed was 54. He took the virginity of Aisha when she was nine, marrying her when she was six. In their own hadith, in their own literature, it says Muhammad was a pedophile. I'm only quoting from what their religion teaches. Yet, people say he's a greater prophet than Jesus. Jesus said, if you hurt a little child, it's better to have a millstone cast around your neck and be cast into the sea. That doesn't matter to the Church of Rome, obviously, and it certainly doesn't matter to Islam. They still believe he's a prophet greater than Christ. It's not reasonable to believe a pedophile is the ultimate prophet of God. It's not reasonable. We are opening a new children's mission in India. I've seen people who drink cow urine. I've seen children with my own eyes going hungry while cows are fed sacks of weeks. To my mind, shoot the cow, give the kid a steak. To their mind, the life of the cow is worth more than the life of the human baby. I have seen it. It is not reasonable to believe a religion like that. What you see in British Columbia is all sanitized. I've lived in the Middle East for years. Unless you've been there, you don't know what real Islam is. Unless you've been to a country like Mexico or Ireland or something, you don't know what real Roman Catholicism is. Unless you've been to India, you don't know what real Hinduism is. You know what the media and the left-wing academic establishment and the politicians tell you. You believe the PR, at least you're expected to believe it. But you're not seeing the real thing. Other religions, for want of a better term, are not reasonable. It's not reasonable to drink cow urine and let a kid go hungry. It's not reasonable to believe this Quaker is living on the moon. It's not reasonable to believe a pedophile. 
is the great prophet. Not Israel. The claims of Jesus, the teachings of the Judeo-Christian scripture are reasonable. Paul says we have the power of a sound mind. You might be crazy before you got saved, but you get the power of a sound I mean, I was, I was strung out on cocaine. I was nuts. All my friends were nuts. You think I'm nuts now? Thank God you didn't know me before I was saved. I'm glad you're laughing. They lost their mind. They could no longer think rationally. They could no longer deal with facts. Critical thought went out the window. Just look at it. There is not an embryologist in the world. There's not a gynecologist in the world. There is not anybody in the world who can answer the questions concerning abortus provocatus. Why is it not infanticide when you're aborting this baby at 30 weeks gestation or 25 weeks gestation when one flight down you're fighting to save the life of a baby 20 weeks gestation who's even younger. Can you please give me some clinical, some scientific criteria why it is not infanticide? They can't give it to you. They've lost their mind. Let's look at reality. In England this week, a medical doctor got in trouble because he was using biological definitions of male and female in diagnosing and treating patients. There's only X and Y. That's it. Chromosomally, you're double X, you're XY. Very rare, triple Y. Sex and Y. That's the reality. Even hermaphrodites, who are born with congenital maldevelopments anatomically in sexual organs, even they are chromosomally either male or female. Even they are. There's no homosexual gene, no lesbian gene. There are markers. But markers are not determinants. For instance, you can get a phenotypic mutation perhaps with somebody from an alcoholic abusive family. Parents were alcoholics, grandparents were alcoholics. Somebody may have markers. They may, there may be a genetic as well as an environmental predisposition to a person born into that kind of a family to become an alcoholic themselves. But they don't have to be. It's only a marker, a warning sign, as it were, a warning sign. You've got high triglycerides, you have two diabetic grandparents, it's a warning sign. Be careful, you can become a diabetic. You've got to watch it. It doesn't mean you're born to be a diabetic. It doesn't mean you can't prevent becoming one. It's not type one, it's type two. Type 1 is different. A type 2 diabetic? You don't have to become a type 2 diabetic. It's just a marker. You go down a road, slow down, dangerous curve ahead. It doesn't mean you have to have a collision or go off the road. It's just a marker telling you there's a risk of it. Yet this doctor gets fired because he will not subscribe to an agenda that is politically and culturally imposed by a society that has lost its mind. The society that's lost its mind says, we will use, we will impose a grammatical definition of male and female. In Hebrew, in Greek, 
in many languages. Masculine and feminine are not to do with sex. They are to do with the way a word is used in the context and construction of a sentence. Peter is Petros, the masculine. Jesus is called in Corinthians Petra, the feminine, for a rock. Isaiah refers to Jesus in the feminine in Isaiah 53. Why? Because in biblical languages, what in Spanish, what would you say el mapa instead of la mapa? Why does it take the masculine article? If it's a feminine, it should be a feminine. Because words are used in the construction of a sentence that determines male and female. It's not biological, it's grammatical definition. So what they've done by consensus is take a grammatical definition of sex and replace the scientific one. They've replaced the genetic definition of male and female with an imposed grammatical one. At the same time, this Christian physician who was fired yesterday is expected to refer to the patient as a male, even though they're a female, or a female, even though they're a male. When he prescribes medication and makes the diagnosis, he's still left with something called biostatics. The side effects of this medication are 27% risk in females, but only 18% risk in males. Women are 31% more predisposed to this kind of infection than men who are only 19%. He still has to deal with the biological definition, the genetic definition, and making a diagnosis and in prescribing a treatment. But at the same time, he's expected to tell that same patient that they're a male or a female. It doesn't make any sense. It's nuts. What they're doing with abortion is nuts. Non-therapeutic abortion, using it as a form of birth control, it's nuts. They've lost their mind. Sins of Sodom, losing their mind. What do you do with the fact that a group of so-called Christian clergy have just publicly had a blessing ceremony, placing a benediction on an abortion clinic. If the church has lost its mind, what do you expect from the society? If the church is no longer salt and light, Jesus said, it's good for nothing but to be trampled down. Don't forget... What you see happening to your society here in Canada, and I'm not picking on Canada, it would be the same in the States or in Britain, Australia, New Zealand, anywhere. It would be the same. We just happen to be in Canada at the moment. What's happening is not primarily the fault of the crooked politicians in Ottawa. It's not primarily the fault of the mainstream media. It's not primarily the fault of left-wing academics. It's primarily the fault of a church that is no longer salt and light. What do we do with the fact that a matter of months ago, a matter of months ago, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention the largest so-called evangelical denomination in the United States, J.D. Greer, gives a keynote address saying, preaching, that born-again Christians, saved Christians, need to become the number one advocates for homosexual and lesbian rights. What rights are they denied? 
they have the rights to adopt children and bring them up in that kind of a relationship where the children are going to be environmentally predisposed to being that themselves, rights, you take out a life insurance policy, you have to fill out a questionnaire about your health. You may have to pay a higher premium because other people should not be forced to pay higher premiums to subsidize you. If you're a smoker, you're going to pay more money. But in the United States, such as California, they're not allowed to ask you if you are HIV because of the homosexual lobby. Everybody else has to subsidize their health care. You're not allowed to ask them about their high risk. Two standards always is. It's not rational. A major evangelical leader saying that we have to become the spokesman for their rights? Their rights include the right to sue a Christian bakery for not making a same-sex wedding cake on the grounds of conscience. That's their right, and you're supposed to be an outspoken advocate for it. This is the Southern Baptist. <laughs> Tony Campola. <coughs> Steve Chalk, the biggest youth minister in the UK. He denies substitutionary atonement. And he performs same-sex marriages. So does Brian McLaren, the guru of the emergent church. <coughs> Now you understand these people profess to be born again? They profess to be regenerate, born of the Spirit? <laughs> they've gone to Sodom and Gomorrah and they've lost their mind. And if you say what I just said, they're going to call you evil. Forget about what God says in his word. That's not a factor in their equation, but let's continue. What's their motive? Verse 23, your rulers are rebels. Companions of thieves, everyone loves a bribe. Chases after rewards, they don't defend the orphan. Nor does the widow's plea come before them. Bill Clinton on the airplane with his friend going down to Florida with the pedophilia. <laughs> I remember Elliot Trudeau and his wife Margaret. Let's not go there. Oh my God. Why do we have leaders like this in government? You have reprobate, morally bankrupt leaders in government because we tolerate reprobate, morally bankrupt leaders in the church. But then it continues. Let's look at verse 2 of chapter 2. Remember, we have no chapter divisions in the Hebrew canon. It'll come about that in the last days, we're not just speaking of Isaiah's day now, we're speaking of the last days. The age of the church. The age of the return of Christ. Ultimately. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and the nations will stream to it. This speaks of the millennial reign of Christ that is coming. Don't worry. The government's going to be on his shoulders. Verse 3. 
Verse 4, he will judge between the nations and render decisions for many people. The Messiah is coming. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never shall they learn war again. In the Hebrew, it's much more powerful and emotive. Lo isa goy la goy herev, lo yil madu hod mil hama. Then it reverts to what precipitates these events and the need for the Lord to come back and take over personally the mess that we've made of what he's given us. Verse 6, you've abandoned your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with influences from the east. They're soothsayers like the Philistines. They strike bargains with the children of foreigners. They are filled with influences from the east. Back to the day of Isaiah, Eastern religion was trying to infiltrate Israel. By the time of Christ, it was Philo and Gnosticism from the east. All false religion comes from Babylon, going back to Nimrod and Semiramis with the Tower of Babel. Now it's Christianity. As I often point out, three times, three times, Eastern religion has inv invaded Western Christendom. The first time was with the post-Nicene fathers, after Constantine pseudo-Christianized the Roman Empire. Buddhist monks came from India to Alexandria. People like Basilides, Valentinus, before that, Oregon. Gnostic spiritualization of the scriptures, monasticism, things like that were the beginning of it. That was the first time Eastern religion invaded Christianity. Second time, the banking families of Italy wanted to control the spice trade to the East and to India because it was revolutionizing the economy of Europe, an agricultural economy, much the same as Europe is dependent on oil from the Middle East today, then it was spices. Yeah, the Crusades went to liberate the Holy Land, but it was economically motivated with the spice trade. With them, they brought back the influences of Shia Islam, of Hinduism, Vishnu praying on beads, mysticism, the candles, the incense. The incense was in the Old Testament, but it had a different meaning. They used it to construct an artificial atmosphere of pseudo-spirituality. Icons and things of this nature, you have it in the Eastern Orthodox Church and in the Roman Church. The influences of the Byzantine Empire, Byzantine Christendom, the influences of Shia Islam and Sufi Islam, and the influences of Hinduism were brought into Europe by the Crusades. That was the second time Eastern religion invades Western Christendom. This is the third time. Remember the laughing and drunken pseudo-revival? That was Kundalini Yoga. You see these crazy people running around pretending to have prophecies? Now, I am not a cessationist. I believe there are charismatic gifts of prophecy. But what you see today is not that. It is mostly clairvoyance. Cindy Jacobs, Stacey Campbell, these crazy women, they're like the Delphic Oracle. It is clairvoyance, soothsayers. It's the occult. Bill Johnson, that's pure Gnosticism and mysticism. It is Eastern religion. My people are filled with influences of the East, says the Lord. They strike bargains with the children of foreigners.
and they're like the Philistines. Strike bargains with foreigners. Go on Rick Warren's website to see his global peace plan. Moses says other gods are demons. Shadim in Hebrew. Paul says other gods are demons. Demonoli in Greek. Rama, Sitra, Shiva, Krishna, these are demons. Allah, the Nabatabian, uh, Nabatabian moon god. <laughs> but on his website, Rick Warren, the purpose-driven lie teaches in his global peace plan that we have to unite with Hindus, Mormons, Muslims, worshippers of other gods, in order to bring in worldwide peace. Now you understand the Antichrist and false prophet are going to attempt to bring about a politically aligned union of false religion in order to bring in a false peace. It's the Lord who's going to cause the nations to beat their spears into pruning hooks. It doesn't happen by aligning with these other nations with other gods. In other words, Rick Warren teaches we have to align with demon worshipers in order to bring in worldwide peace. This is the peace philosophy of the purpose-driven liar. That man works for Satan. That book was dictated from the pit of hell. Yet it's become a guidebook for mainstream evangelicism. They strike bargains with the children of foreigners, foreign gods. The land's been filled with idols, verse 8. How many Hindu temples and mosques do you have in Vancouver? Now remember, he's speaking eschatologically, as it were, in a last day's framework. Verse 12 to verse 22. He speaks of the day of the Lord, a day of reckoning. It's all about what's going to happen. The final end time judgment from verses 12 through verse 22. But when you get to chapter 3, verse 3, whoa. You're listening to the skillful enchanter. <laughs> the Kansas City false prophets, Mike Bickle, I hop. Michael Brown, these are enchanters. They're demonstrable false prophets. Michael Brown has predicted things that haven't happened. Mike Bickle has predicted things in the name of the Lord that haven't happened. The Kansas City prophets a collection of alcoholics, womanizers, and homosexuals had predicted things that have not happened. The people will be oppressed, each one by another, and each one by his neighbor. The youth will storm against the elders. Satan always aims for the youth. Instead of the faith being held by all generations. He always goes after the kids. He's got the kids, he's got the future. Don't take my word for it. Go on internet and read for yourself. You're a commonwealth country. You know what a royal commission is. The royal commission in Australia determined that the patriarch of Hillsong, Frank Houston, was a homosexual pedophile. I knew Pentecostal preachers in Australia and New Zealand who told me that 30 years ago, but they couldn't prove it. The Royal Commission, after a 
criminal investigation did. But they also proved that his son, Brian Houston, protected him. I thought only the Catholic Church did that. My native New York. Go watch it on YouTube. Carl Lynn's The Women's Conference of Hillsong. Oh, my good Lord. A Jesus figure coming out in female drag dresses the American Statue of Liberty instead of a crown of thorns, the crown of the Statue of Liberty. I was born in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> and it comes out and they're singing the Frank Sinatra song, New York, New York, at their worship session. Then at the grand finale of their worship session, which was choreographed with pyrotechnics. And if it has pyrotechnics, it had to be pre-planned because you have to get permits from the fire department to do it. It has to be inspected by the fire department to get the permits to use pyrotechnics at some kind of a concert or sports event or whatever. You can't do it unless it is licensed by the fire department. It had to be pre-planned. I'm not joking. The naked cowboy comes out. Wearing cowboy boots, a cowboy hat, and holding a guitar. And between two and three thousand Christian Hillsong women are waving their hands, singing. That's their worship. And they aim for the youth. Bill Johnson aims for the youth. Mike Bickle, IHOP, aim for the youth. They all aim for the youth because that's what their boss in hell told them to do. Verse 12, my people, the oppressors are children. Women rule over them, my people. Those who guide you, lead you astray and confuse the direction of your paths. We are warned not to allow young believers to be leadership material in the church. Now, I'm not talking about biological age. God told Jeremiah and Timothy, let no one look down on your youth. You can get somebody from a Christian family who got saved when he was a kid, and by the age of 25, he's got his head screwed on straight. But you've got these people who don't know the scriptures. They haven't been saved that long. And they make them leaders. Screwballs. And that's what people are listening to. Scripturally ignorant screwballs. And the daughters of Jezebel. Joyce Meyer, false teacher, Beth Moore, Cindy Jacobs, take your pick. These are the leaders. You want to know why you have someone like Trudeau's son, Pierre Trudeau, as your prime minister, a young guy who's not doing If the church is going to have people who are unqualified, what do you expect? You understand what happens? It's music groups like Hillsong. Instead of getting their doctrine from the exposition of Scripture, they get their doctrine from cliches gleaned from singing choruses repetitively. Too ignorant to know that it's a mantra. It comes from Hinduism. Jesus warned against it. Do not repeat empty phrases as the heathen do, but they sing the same choruses. The same 15 words 30 times. And then, it has a mesmerizing effect. The Greek word is mesmero, to put the evil eye on somebody in Galatians. 
and they sing this, this becomes their leaders. I just had two guys who were in Darlene Trek's band at Hillsong who left, they saw through it, and they came to my meeting in Sydney, Australia about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. They told me what it was. It was the business and it was this. They don't have a clue. Then it goes on. Verse 18, look how the women dress. Now again, I've got no problem with earrings and lipstick. In the Greek, it's diminutive. Women adorn yourselves modestly. Okay. It's not a prohibition on makeup and coffee per se. In the Song of Solomon, the bride is adorned with cosmetics. Thing is, in the Jewish culture, it meant one thing. But in the Greek culture, it, it was the uniform of the hieros gamos, of the, of the temple prostitutes. And what Paul was saying is, don't look like a whore. You ever notice these women tele-evangelists, they look like old whores? They look like old prostitutes, too old for the game. Why do they look like that? They are personifications of the whore of Babylon. They look like the whore of Babylon because that's what they represent. Gordy, even the world makes fun of them. Again, I have no problem with cosmetics or jewelry, but they look, that, they look like the world, even the world makes fun of them. And that day the Lord will take away the beauty of their anklets, their headbands, their crescent ornaments, their dangling earrings. One of these days, Joyce Meyer is going to shake her head and those earrings are going to knock her teeth clean down her throat. And so it goes on. Then comes the parable of the vineyard. God says what he's going to do. You want to know what's going to happen to the church? Look at what happened to Israel when they did these things. The abandonment of reason and critical thoughts. We are commanded in Hebrews 4 verse 12 to judge critically on the basis of Scripture. It's not an option. Oh, you have a critical spirit? I hope so. If you don't, there's something wrong with you. Critical does not mean to find fault. It means to judge objectively on the basis of the evidence and light of the Word of God. Let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I'll remove its hedge. It'll be consumed. I'll break down its walls and will become trampled ground. I'll lay it to waste. It'll not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I'll also charge the clouds to rain. No rain on it. In other words, Isaiah 44.3, the Holy Spirit will not be poured out on it. Look very briefly at Isaiah 44.3. We'll be finishing in a moment. I'll pour out rain on the thirsty ground, streams on the dry ground. I'll pour out my spirit on your offspring. There's not going to be any revival. God's not going to pour out his spirit. They're under his judgment. There'll be no rain. For the vineyard of the Lord is the whole house of Israel. The vineyard of the Lord is the assemblies of God. The vineyard of the Lord is the Baptist church. The vineyard of the Lord is the church of England. Take your pick. And then Isaiah predicts, judgment will come. The Lord will allow the surrounding nations to invade them. Look at chapter 5, verse 26. What are those nations today? 
Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. What is the religion of those nations? Pay attention. I had a relative killed September 11th. Brings me no joy to face this. I was in a situation in Israel where I, I, if I'd been there, five minutes later I would have been killed, probably. Terrible, terrible. Killed 17 people on a bus for it. Terrible. Islam is a judgment on the Judeo-Christian world. You hear what I said? It is a judgment. Those same nations were God's judgment on Israel, and they are God's judgment on North America and Europe. Denmark. 4% Muslim population in Denmark. 40% of the people on the dole, however, are Muslim. They see it as the demi. The infidel has to pay them a penalty for not being a Muslim. That's how they see welfare and the dole and social benefit. They're entitled to it according to their religion. 70% of the rapes in Denmark are committed by the 4% Muslim population. How can 4% perpetrate 70% of the rapes with more than 90% of the victims being Danish women? This is true all over Europe. It is God's judgment. Oh, don't worry. The way he dealt with the Philistines is the way he's going to deal with militant Islam. Their judgment is coming. But in conclusion, what does he say after he says, woe to those who call good evil and evil good? What does he say in the parable of the vineyard? In the year of the death of King Hezekiah, I saw the Lord standing on his throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, two his feet, and two he flew. One called to the other, Kodesh, 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 holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. What is Isaiah's reaction? Woe is me, I am ruined. Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Oh, he saw all the evil of the society. The sins of Sodom. The abandonment of rational thought, the moral decay, the idolatry, the compromise with false religion. He saw all of this. He said they're calling good evil and evil good. But then he had to deal with an even more powerful problem. He had to deal with the man I saw in the mirror today when I cleaned my teeth and shaved my ugly face. Seeing these things and then beholding the glory of the Lord. Depart from me, Lord. I'm a man of unclean lips. What did Peter say when he saw Jesus? Oh, he knew all about how corrupt the Pharisees were, but what did he say? Depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. What can I say? I'm no better and no different than Isaiah. I am no better and no different than Peter. And either are you. This is the problem. 
Yes, the Lord is coming, and yes, we see what is wrong with them. May he open our eyes before he comes to see what is wrong with us. Then he'll tell us the next move. Thank you for listening. Thank you.